So you you really you've got the best of all worlds because you're you're discovering, you're working at the bench with a team of scientists and in very, very heavy research looking and doing conducting experiments. And then on the other side of the coin, you're sitting down with real patients who are suffering and living day in and day out with cancer, and you're getting that viewpoint as well. So I, I have to ask you, in sitting on both sides of the fence here like you do, um, a lot of patients will call us or email us and they'll say, you know, I have cancer and I have been looking into a clinical study, but I don't want to be, quote, the term I hear a lot is guinea pig. I don't want to be the guinea pig. And they have questions for us such as, if I enroll in a clinical study, um, will I get if, I, if I'm not getting the innovative therapy, will I get something that's substandard and a lesser form of care? And of course, there are, we want to dispel that myth because it simply is not true, but how, how do you talk to patients about the possibility of entering into a clinical study and the benefit that's there for them? Sure. Uh, for me, there's clinical trials, phase one, phase two, phase threes. Those discussions kind of vary based on the phase. The phase one trials are usually trials that are geared absolutely towards um, evaluating the safety of the therapy. So there really is no standard of care because those are patients that have really exhausted all standard of care mechanisms. So we're looking at new therapies that are potentially uh, going to be able to mediate some response in the patients. But you know, it's very. I always try to be very clear that we're not um, doing these trials in the expectation that it may help you. Our goal is to make sure that it's safe. But this is step one. You know, this is how we get to the next step in terms of looking at, at efficacy. Um, for patients where it's a phase two or phase three trial where you're getting compared to, a, to another therapy, that therapy is always considered to be a standard of care therapy. So it's never a substandard therapy. Um, so you're being given at least what we consider standard of care and the other arm is the experimental arm where it may improve upon the standard of care, but we at least know since it's gone through a phase one trial that it's safe, that we don't believe this is going to harm people. It's not gonna be worse than the standard of care. And this is the process. I mean, and I, I have been, um, I finished my training and I started my training in 2006. So in 10 years, um, I've seen just a vast change in how things have gone from the lab to uh, clinical trials and now soon to be standard of care for patients. So uh, my best example of this that I speak about patients is acute leukemia, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Uh, when I started in my fellowship, I would see patients basically get multiple years of chemotherapy, high doses, three, four, five years of chemotherapy. And unfortunately, most of the patients ended up dying of that disease. And seeing how we worked on uh, a therapy in the laboratory that we then translated to a phase one trial, you know, I sat there with patients and said, we've worked on this in the lab, it works well in mice, we don't know how it's going to work in humans, we need to first evaluate the safety. And uh, some patients, you know, were concerned because it's experimental cell therapy. And, you know, they were, they, they said no. Other patients um, felt that this was something that, uh, considering that there were no other options, and that it's gone through uh, regulatory screening at the FDA, at our Institutional Review Board, at the, at the Recombination DNA Activating uh, Advisory Committee, people said at least it seems to be safe, it should get some clinical evaluation. Well, those clinical trials were, were phenomenal, and now they're actually in phase two trials. So from starting in 2006 to probably uh, almost 11 years afterwards, we're actually probably gonna get the first clinical indication for the cell modified uh, therapy for acute, um, for at least diffuse large B cell lymphoma and probably shortly afterwards acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So that's how the process works, from the lab to phase one, phase two, sometimes phase three trials to standard care for patients. And it's a process and sometimes, uh, I certainly understand patients um, are concerned about that, but there are years that go into evaluating this therapy before it ever gets into a single patient. And there's not one person that's deciding is this safe for patients? There's dozens, dozens of, of, of very trained, highly intelligent scientists and physicians that evaluate this therapy to make sure it is uh, 
worthy of, of investigation in human beings. So before we ever even present the trial to it, it's had to come through years of evaluation. So a lot of exciting changes over the last 10 years. When you sit back and think of cancer care and where it's going into the future, what really gets you excited? Well, I think now we have the, the standard of care with, with chemotherapies, and now we have uh, immunotherapies that's really uh, generating tremendous excitement. And now we have the personalized genomic medicines that you've kind of discussed before, being able to look at a patient's tumor genomics and identify drugs off the shelf that may be very um, responsive uh, to their patient's tumor. And now we're hopefully going to be combining all three of these modalities. So cancer is very, very wily, very, very tricky. And if you come at it with just one um, uh, therapy, it's going to figure a way to get around it. We've seen relapses from chemotherapy. We've seen relapses from immunotherapy. We've seen relapses from uh, personalized genomic medicine. The hope is that as we combine these things together, the cancer is not going to be able to adapt to it. So I'm really excited in these next five to 10 years, how we breathe these things together and able to increase those response rates for these patients with really um, no viable treatment options to be able to increase the patients that are responding to these therapies. Well, doctor, thanks so much for coming by and I really appreciate all the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thanks.